And then it just one book after another, and then articles came out, and I was, um, did a lot of sort of writing in magazine articles about building, building, construction, and I've written nine non non-fiction books on construction and, and uh, uh, building code. And then when I retired, I think the second time, I started writing, and I've written uh, one of fiction. And I, that was my dream, to be able to do that. And you can't do that when you're working, because you've got to stay in touch with everything that's cutting edge technology and all that. And so I didn't have a chance to sort of let my creative mind work. But after the second time, I felt free enough that I could write. So I started writing, and that was my first book. This is the first stone. So I'll pass this around when you look at it. And um, then um, I worked on this book for uh, quite some time, actually. But uh, it, it finally came out in, uh, I think it was two and a half, three years ago, something like that. But the first stone, let me tell you a little bit about my characters and, and what, what I write and how I write and what my motivation is. Um, I learned this weekend, uh, when, when someone was talking about memoirs, that what I really write is, is I'm writing a memoir, but I'm writing it through the eyes of two brothers. Uh, everything I've written is, is through the eyes of two brothers. Uh, one is white, one is black, but they're brothers. Uh, one, the, the black uh, brother was adopted when they were age five. They're uh, six months apart. They're very close in age, but they grow up together and they're very close to each other. Uh, and these two brothers are my alter ego. And I, I let them sort of speak for me uh, in all the ethos that they have, all their, uh, their, 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 their value systems, uh, all, of, all of who they are, basically. I let them sort of speak. And I let them encounter a lot of problems. Uh, in this book, I talk about a lot of, I focus on forgiveness. So you know, writing about forgiveness, you have to have some bad things that happen to you. And in, in that, there's, there's some gruesome scenes in this, in this novel. Uh, there's many different characters that do some bad things, things that they have remorse for, things that they have grief about or wish they hadn't done. And it's, it's uh, going through that grief process and accepting it, being able to, being able to forgive, ultimately forgive yourself. And, and of course, forgive others, I mean, ask for forgiveness from other people. But the biggest thing I think that, that I try to focus on is forgiving ourselves. And so I focus on that a lot in this book, and I have some good notes. So, uh, um, this is Power of Forgiveness, and it's a story of errant actions and sort of their consequences, and sort of how we deal with uh, that kind of uh, uh, grief that we have stuck in our head. We have a lot of guilt that we carry around in our life. And imagine if we could only get rid of that guilt and, and then live your life free of guilt. What could you accomplish creatively if you did that? Uh, it's transforming remorse into forgiveness, and uh, I, that's what the first stone is about. First stone comes from a uh, quote in the Bible that Jesus said to a group of men that were trying to stone a woman who was alleged to be prostitute. And so they were throwing, going to throw stones at her. So he took them aside and said, who is without sin can cast the first stone. Uh, he wrote something in writing, and you'll see in the very beginning there's a line drawing of that that sort of depicts that, uh, that, that incident out of the Bible. But that's kind of what the, where the title came from, is casting the first stone. Uh, the second book I wrote is a sequel sort of to that. This book spans about 93 years, and it goes from um, the two brothers' ancestors, some of their ancestors, and it carries them forward, so you give something of a background of, of who they are, of what they're, what they're like. Uh, and the second book capitalizes on that. This puts them ahead in, in time, somewhere around the uh, year 2000, a little bit after 2000. This is high rise, and at this point, Billy Woods, the uh, black brother, has become the billing official for the city of Norfolk, which I was the billing official for 13 years in the city of Norfolk. I know something about that. So Billy was the uh, building official there, and the opening scene is a murder scene, but you know who did it, because you're the only one, though. You're the reader. No one else in the book knows anything about who did it. So the, the storyline isn't a murder uh, uh, or a, a, a crime scene or a crime uh, novel, but basically it's, it's a story about forgiveness, ultimately. And it, it's uh, this, the person that did this did this out of rage, and he did it out of sort of self-interest, obviously, 
what he had was a, uh, it, was, it was not, um, it was money, it was motivated by achieving uh, growth uh, professionally. He wanted to, to, to be a, 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 an engineer. Uh, he, he was an engineer, but he wanted to be a very successful engineer. So he was trying to bribe a building inspector to, to turn the other way where he would approve things that were incorrect. And the building inspector wanted more money. So the engineer threw him off the building and he died. So it opens with that scene. And it, it sort of goes from there. You end up uh, with the, uh, sort of, you, you have all the characters that are trying to find out who did it and why they did it. And there's a lot of uh, things behind the scenes that are in this book that include things like uh, murder, betrayal, personal gain, um, and of course, power forgiveness. Um, it, it, it's the two brothers uh, are together in this in this book. The, the first one, they're not together, but it sets the scene for them. But the two brothers work together for the first time in this book. Uh, the third book that I have finished, and it's in the final throes of editing, and should be finished completely this week and go to publication. I talked to the publisher uh, this weekend, and she said that she's got um, very minor things that have to be done yet. Yeah. And so that, and once it gets done, everything else is typed set. It just goes to Amazon and the print and it's published. The fourth book, that's, I'm oh, sorry, that is Last Kiss. And um, I, I was asked to be prepared to read something that is, with your permission, if that's okay. Um, there's a. <laughs> I, okay, but I won't read it. <laughs> Let it go free. Okay. Is that okay? You're going to sit on my right No. Yeah, let it loose. I'm going to give you a little bit of background. In, in this book, um, let it be loose. Okay. What, what happens is um, the, the brothers are a bit older. This, this is my last kid, so it's somewhere when the two brothers are in their 80s. So, so this is sort of way ahead in time. And in order for this plot line to work, what I had to do was I had to have one of the wives of the two brothers died. And that's about the only way. What I wanted to do was create a, uh, a mechanism that uh, would allow a spirit from the wife to go into the husband's building. That, that was my, my reason for needing to have that happen. So I needed to have, I needed to have Laura die. Well, I finished the book somewhere around September and I gave it to my wife to read uh, the draft and she read it and she said, she knew that I used her as sort of the alter ego for Laura. And she looked at it, she read it, and she said, Oh, so you kill me off in this book. <laughs> uh, it was a little bit of a lighthearted laugh, but uh, so this is a, a little bit about what happens is uh, Billy has, has made a or, uh, Billy has made a promise that Laura has kept, is trying to keep him to give her a last kiss. What is the thing? Deadly. Okay. It wasn't my idea. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, um, and so Billy is, is, is uh, struggling with what's going on. And here's the first chapter. The hospice room was dim and empty except for the two of us. The only sound was the slow but quiet beating from the instrument at her bedside. I realized that my breathing matched the beat of her heart. Her breath was labored but beautiful. The end of her life before her conclusion. The only unanswered question was, how long? Why are you smacking your lips? What do you need? Silence. Through tears that seemed to come from my gut, I implored her, Laura, why are you leaving me? My tears fell from her bed sheet. Silence. Our life together was perfect. You always said it was a gift from God. Laura, everything I've ever wanted is in your heart. Why? Silence. Why would you abandon me? Our lives are meant to be lived together. We both knew that, didn't we? Her mouth was dry. Is that the drugs? I touched a moist palm to her lips, now puckered, like she was putting on chapstick. Damn it, Laura, why do you have to die? Damn your God for taking him from me and from me. Damn his ass. The room was still, except for her breathing, that damn machine. The hospice nurse entered to take Laura's vitals. Although her name tag was too happy to announce, Joyce. The interruption brought relief. After all, I was about to take God outside and kick his ass. Um, that's Laura's middle name, I said, pointing her name tag. Joyce? Well, Joy. Joyce responded with a smile and nodded. Laura was everything to me, Joyce. 
thing her name gave me goosebumps. Um, boy, did I get a little moving? Um, and <laughs> now I have to uh, re-scroll, so my apologies. Got it. Um, goosebumps, especially when I realized that uh, I had used the past tense. Joyce lifted Laura's limp arm into the cuff of the blood pressure monitor, then recorded her vital signs. When I thought Joyce had left the room, I turned back to Laura and played with her hand in mine. Laura, you told me how to love. I learned what love is from you. I said, then noticed Joyce is still in the room, adjusting the instruments. When I liked the eyes with her, she glanced downward as if to apologize for eavesdropping. I felt the need to explain. I was divorced when I met Laura, an emotional wreck. When Joyce moved closer and gave me her full attention, I took it as a signal to continue. I felt betrayed by the world and lost faith in a happy life. I was held bent on remaining a bachelor. I fell into drinking and drugs to escape, I guess. I sure as hell didn't help. Then one day I heard Cheryl Crow singing, The First Cut is the Deepest. I paused to look at Laura. You know the line that goes, If you want, I'll try to love again. My tears continued to drift faster than I could wipe them away. Joyce remained immobile, seemingly transfixed on my story. I needed to talk. I did that. I gave Laura my heart with that first kiss, and she took care of me. She nourished me with love ever since. Joyce still hadn't spoken, but her face wore a sympathetic gaze, and now her hand rested on my shoulder. I never knew true love until Laura's. She remade me. She made me whole again. I even stopped at a bottle. I don't only drink on special occasions, and I don't miss it. It had to be a love that saved me. True love has that miraculous power, Joyce said. I sometimes called her by her middle name, Joy, because she always brought that. I told her how joyful she made me all the time. But the truth is, she made everyone around her joyful. People were drawn to her. The visceral pain hit me. I had done it again, <clears throat> the past tense. Yet this once beautiful woman, still alive and radiating joy, even in her unconscious state. Joyce squeezed my shoulder and left, returning the room to a somber destiny. Laura's breathing became raspy now. Laura, please let me trade places with you. God, please let me trade places with her. I'm sorry I said what I said. I don't know what I thought. I take it back. Um, take it all back. I beg you to take me instead. She deserves to live. Please let her live. I don't want to be alone. Take me, then. Take me. Her lips puckered again. What is it? What are you trying to say to me? Well, Laura, what do you want? The promise. Now remember the phone. You make your promise. I sat on the side of the bed and looked at my wife, trying to capture the memory of her drawing that still beautiful face. Positioning my tall frame, I leaned toward her face. My black hands played with her flawless porcelain skin. As our noses touched, her cheeks seemed to glow, and I thought she was about to open her eyes. She inhaled a deep breath and held it. She let it go and I kissed her. In her last breath, filled my arms. I didn't want to exhale. I felt her spirit leave her body, and she was still. The machine stopped. I couldn't let go. First step. That's, that's <laughs>
there's a big difference. When you're in an Arab country, that's the Arabian Sea. When you're in a Persian country, it's the Persian Sea. So when I was there, I wrote, I began doing a lot of this book. And in writing this, I wanted to make a character from Abu Dhabi. So I, I used the time I was there with a, with a friend of mine to help me get a lot of cultural background. And so I, I, that, you'll see that reflected in this book. So in, uh, uh, almost every bit of research I've done has been sort of personal or, or experience, experiential, uh, where I've uh, explained to people or learned how life works in a certain culture and try to put that into my writing and make that real. So uh, the, uh, the, the fourth book is a book that is, is finished and I'm in the middle of writing or uh, it's in the middle of being edited at this point by uh, our, our editor uh, and our publication company. And the fourth book is the, uh, the two brothers when they're just getting out of the Marine Corps and they were both in, in the Marine Corps and they were in Vietnam, they get out together and they're going to college. Both of them are going to New Mexico. One is going to New Mexico State University, which is where I went. And the other is going to the University of New Mexico, which is Albuquerque. So uh, the two are interstate rivals, so you can imagine the discussion between the two brothers when they, when they talk about their, their alma mater. But uh, in, in that book, I, I deal with the, uh, I'm going to say the oppression of the, uh, the, the LGBTQ plus people in the 1970s, in 1970, 1971 time period, particularly by the church and, and what I guess we would call the Christian church and what the Christian church sort of did to sort of uh, bring shame and harm to, to that group of people. And uh, it was basically the two brothers uh, encounter friends that are LGBTQ, that are gay men, and, and how their exploits uh, change their perspective of their life or, or their, their view of, of gay people. Uh, and again, how we, uh, how we have maybe done a wrong. And, and it's a, a wrong that, that I, I'd say ends up hopefully becoming a right uh, in this book. And the, the, so that's the fourth book. So I think I've taken out my lot of time. Is that right? I'm feeling the book <laughs> and I'll try to pause and see if there's any very quick questions, and, and I'll try to answer them quickly and get on to the uh, most important act of the day, here, which is uh, which is Robin. <laughs> if, if you do like have an interest in buying books, I would recommend the first one first, which I have both of them for sale uh, next door. They're both thirteen ninety five, and I do have a little card for you, so I can get your credit card. But I'd love to have you. Uh, buy a book, but I'd also want to have you at least follow me, and uh, I have a website, and I have business cards and a uh, bookmarks and so forth in, in, in the next room that you'll be able to see, uh, and I'd love to have you there. If there's any questions, I'll try to answer but, Oh, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, there, there's something that you're going to see out here. <laughs> you're going to stand up and show everybody to make sure they see it. It says, this, I'm a character. This is a little <laughs> sticker that... Uh, that I, that I have, that what I, my, my publisher thought it would be a great idea, and I like the idea of being able to offer an opportunity if somebody wants to have their name in a future novel to sign up. So there's a little sign up sheet. And so the cost to you is to be able to give me your email address so I can let you know when the book comes out. That's the cost. I, I don't, it, this is my personal thing, I don't sell this to anybody or anything like that. So, and I know I hate. Junk mail too, but uh, I, I think I get about four or five hundred email junk email a day. It's like I know how bad that is. I, I promise not to do that. But if, if you do uh, want to have your name in the book, I'm, I'm happy to take your name. Which you work for you? Yes, sir. Um, I was just curious. Uh, it seems like you didn't plan to be an author. Didn't you like to be in your life. So when you started out writing, did you have an idea of? These two characters, and then so nice of one book, and then another book, and then another book, or did no, it just happen? It just happened. It just happened. And I'm, I'm so glad you asked that because that's an important part of my writing I wanted to share with um, I, I met one of my favorite, when I was just reading for pleasure, I met one of my favorite readers or writers, and that's David Babaji. I met him a couple of times. In the one time it was in D.C., it was at a very good book fair. There was no one in his line. I was the only one there. And so he sat there and talked to me as long, I mean, until someone came up. 
And so I had this privilege of talking for many minutes. And so I asked him, I just finished the book, I took Kevin Sonny, I said, tell me how to write, tell me, tell me what your secret is. And he said, what I would recommend for you and what you have in mind to do is build characters first and know everything about your characters first. To, to know what color their hair is, uh, who their girlfriend is, um, I know everything about what church they go to, what clothes they wear, uh, build a character analysis on, on the, each of them. Uh, what are they, what people do they like, what are they associated with, why, what is their interest, build that completely and do that to all your characters and then put them in play with a general theme, not an outline. He, he said, don't ever outline, that was a Stephen King never outlined in a novel. Just, just have a general storyline, an idea of what you want to say. I wanted to write forgiveness, let's say. So if, what do I have to do with forgiveness? Well, I have to create something bad. What, what can I create bad? Well, I've got to show a backstory so when we start at the beginning. I want to get back to 1910 or 20 to, to start the book. So I have to create the backstory and create that. And I created, so I, that's how it happened. It just, one thing led to another. And I, I let the characters tell me what happens what to, to, to them and what they want to do. It, the oddest thing um, ha, ha, seems to happen with characters telling me what they want to do. And the more interesting thing happens when they tell me what they want to do. When I try to force it in, it, it's almost like, oh, that doesn't work. I have to go back and change it all. And I, I go to sleep at night and I just say, tell me what you want me to do. And, just, and I get up the next day and I got an idea. So I put that in and, and it works. So yeah. it's like that. And it, and it seems it seems like this stuff, it seems like I write because they won't let me alone. They, they, keep, <laughs> they keep telling me, keep writing, keep saying something, because I won't want to tell the story. Like they want the story to be told. So that's why I keep writing. So what happens after they're in their 80s? Is there, oh. another, is there another one yet? I haven't gotten ahead of age, no, but that's next. Nice. <laughs> 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 uh, but I, I want to build something on the middle part of their life when I, when I can. And, and uh, I guess this, this turned out to be like some of the Tom Clancy uh, uh, sequence of things where he, he's writing sort of stuff all over the place. And there's a, I, I saw an index book one time, it was a whole book, it was an index of the order of books to read for Tom Clancy if you want to read them in the corner. And I, I thought, maybe that's what I need to do is build something like that. But that seems to be how it's, it's going. It's, it's just writing them with the idea of what is important to me to write about at that time. So. Yes, ma'am. I was looking at your website yesterday. Are you uh -huh. also a pastor? In a I, well, I did. I'm not. Uh, I'm not yet, yeah. Seth. I, had a, I, I, I belong to the Wingsburg Baptist Church, which is one of my, a, 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 an affirming, uh, and I'm not going to get the term right, but it basically is it's accepting all people, all stripes, um, affirming the church. So it, it honors and recognizes validity of any, anyone, LGBTQ, any, anyone. Thank you for that. Any, anyone. And we, we want people, and also, believe it or not, in religion, if anybody, we there's people that come to it um, that have Buddhist tendencies or Hindu tendencies. And so, uh, but there, there's people like that that are, are attending this church. I got interested in the church and maybe trying to say something to, to, to the group. The is a really good group. And I wanted to tell people uh, something that I've always felt is that each of us are the image of God. And I, I told my pastor one night, I'd like to write a sermon about that. And he said, well, write it, and I'll help you. It took me a year to write a sermon. I could never be a preacher. I, mean, I, I, I went to a, I went to an Episcopal priest in Texas who did a website on, on, on that exact thing. And uh, two or three other people, and I talked to them about this, and they helped me write it. I sent them what I was going to do. They came back with ideas. And it took me a year to write this thing. So, the pastor one day said he had to leave on something unexpected when I give that term. And it was, I had about a week's notice, so I had to brush up and get ready. So I give a sermon at, at, on, on that. That's probably what you saw. But no, I'm not. I am not a pastor. And when I was in high school, you know, those badly attempts you take, 
uh, what do you want to be, or what should you be when you right. became a preacher? I'm like, what if you think that's the truth? Like, I'm a preacher. Thank you. So, I was always being curious about you alluded to the word memoir. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you have a view on the difference between a memoir and an autobiography? A uh, memoir and what? An autobiography. Oh, yes, there is a difference. I learned that last night. Ah, I'm not going to be able to repeat it as well as it uh, was done by the, uh, the, the... The autobiography is a complete thorough story. Yeah. A memoir is focusing on significant events of things that changed their life. Not, not, uh, not even necessarily a sequence of events, but spotted sort of events through their life that made a big difference in their life. Is that That's what I thought. It, it enables you to leave out the bits that you don't really want to <laughs> see. <laughs> Maybe that much out, I think. <laughs> and it wouldn't be a very long book for me. <laughs> you know what, that is pretty short. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, take, I'm taking up the real author's time, so I'm going to say Thank you all very much for having me.